good to see you in God's house today. Thank you for those of you who are joining our second service today. We have about, uh, I think right at, right at 60, or as Toby registered for the first service. Um, we've got uh, pretty close to that, it looks like, for the second service, so praise the Lord. And, and we know that each week now, as people are getting more comfortable and getting a bit uh, more free coming out, uh, that will be we'll have more and more coming. So we, we're, we're excited about our church services getting <coughs> excuse me, uh, back to normal. I don't know if you were here last Sunday, uh, but if you came back this Sunday, you already know that uh, we've got more chairs in the church. This week, the government did pass a new uh, stipulation that instead of 1.5 meters, we could be at 1.2 meters. So that's what your chairs are now. And we're hoping in a few weeks, maybe they'll move it to one meter, then they'll move it to a half meter. Then we'll just be all back together before we go. Amen. So I hope that's going to come quickly, uh, quicker than we think and quicker than we hope. Uh, they did also lift the regulation on children and on our senior citizens. So everybody can come to church now. Uh, any age child and any age adult can come. So uh, some of our children are already excited. And uh, on the uh, 18th of October, that's two Sundays from now, we're going to start our children's ministry uh, programs back. And Pastor Beth is going to get his team ready and going. We will continue to do uh, the online uh, for our children for a time. Uh, and I, I don't know how he'll do that. If he will record the service and put that up. Or if he will continue to do the type of service he's doing now. We'll leave that to Pastor Beth for the plan. But we will continue some online ministry for the kids. But we want you to know, feel free to bring them. We're actually, uh, this week we started cleaning the building over there and washing everything down. And we're doing new paint on the floors over there. Uh, so uh, make to make it well. We'll have all the, the same social distancing we have, the kids will have. Uh, and, and we all know that's a little harder to do with kids, but we will, we will do our best to make sure that that stays in place. Amen. So that's coming up. So we're excited about that. Take your Bibles this morning. Go to the book of 2 Chronicles. I told the first service to go to the book of Jehoshaphat. Uh, and uh, they all looked at me like I was going completely out of my mind. But I made a mistake there. But go to 2 Chronicles. And we're going to talk about Jehoshaphat. How many of you were here last Sunday uh, for in service service? Let me see your hands. Did it up high? Okay, about uh, eight or ten, that'd be good. So some of you, this is your first time seeing the sanctuary uh, like it is. How do you like it? Do you like the way we've done? Yes. Yes, it, it looks totally different, doesn't it? When you walk in, everything outside is the same, but when you walk in, it's like a whole different place. So, uh, for all the people who worked very hard, uh, thank you for that. Most of this we had, of course, we contracted out and had contractors do it, but uh, uh, you pay for this through your tithing, through your giving, through your support, and we thank you for that so much. And, and we're happy with how it's turned out. Still just a few little minor things to get things going, but uh, we, we're excited about how it looks. So thank you for your blessings there. Last Sunday we began talking about uh, this King Jehoshaphat. And we talked last Sunday uh, about, uh, basically in chapter 20, we talked about, we started with verse 1, 2, and 3, and then we jumped down to verse 9, and we, we talked about this, this uh, coalition of three armies that were coming against the, the uh, tribe of Judah, that were coming against the Israelites. And you have to remember, uh, those of you that were here last week, and if you weren't, at this time, the nation of Israel has divided. And you have, there were, there were originally are 12 tribes of Israel when, when God laid them out through his servant Jacob who became Israel. Uh, but at this point in their history, the tribe of Judah has separated itself from the rest of the tribes of, of Israel. So you have Israel and then you have Judah. And if you're reading your Bible, especially in 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, 1 and 2 Samuel, you have to really pay attention so whether the Bible is talking about Israel or they're talking about Judah. And today, especially most of the book of the Chronicles talks about the nation of Judah uh, and the tribe of Judah. And that's who Jehoshaphat is, the king of the tribe of Judah. And uh, these, these three armies, these three uh, nations are coming against the tribe of Judah. They are the Ammonites, they are the Moabites, 
and they are the Munites. And I'll tell you more about them in just a moment. We talked about them pretty uh, intently last Sunday, and I hope you watched online. But if you didn't, I'll try to give you some information. But as they were coming against them, Jehoshaphat went to prayer. Uh, the Bible says the first thing he did, and we'll read it in just a moment, he feared uh, and fear came upon him just like any of us when we're being attacked from the outside, whether it be by a great nation of, of, of great uh, armies of great nations, which most of us don't deal with that, but we're attacked by spiritual attacks and physical attacks within our bodies, within our finances, within our homes. Uh, but when the enemy comes in, we do fear, and fear is a natural uh, thing that happens to us. But it says he feared, but then, as you see on your screen, it says he set himself to seek the Lord. And today, the title of our message last week and today, and this is a series we're doing as he set himself to seek to lo the Lord. And today is part two. And part two is subtitled, But Our Eyes Are On You, O Lord. But Our Eyes Are On You. So let's go to the scripture and just read a couple of verses. Then we'll come back in a few minutes and we'll read more of the scripture. Verse number three, which is our, our, our key scripture, our key text for the message. It said, And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And then if you'll go down to verse number 12, verse number 12, uh, we will read this text, and he says, O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Amen. Father, I pray that you bless the reading of your word. I bless, pray that you bless the preaching of your word today. As I declare these truths that I feel that you've given me for this church and for this congregation, I pray that you would help me to share with clarity, but I also pray that you would help me share with an anointing. I pray that the words I speak will be like the, like the pen of a ready writer, God, that as I speak them, they will write themselves upon the hearts of the men and the women here in this congregation today. And I pray that you would just let them minister and let them make a change and a transformation in their lives. And I pray that at the end of the day that you would receive the glory, that you would receive the praise for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things last week we focused on with the reading is in verse number 9. And in that verse it says, uh, and this was kind of my theme of last Sunday, that as when the enemy comes and when trials come and we even uh, related it to this whole situation of corona and COVID and how it comes. And even now as things are opening up, there's still a lot of fear out there and there's still a lot of anxiousness and anxiety that people just don't know what's happening and what's going on. I actually meant for us to pray uh, this morning and today and we haven't done it. We'll do it, Pastor Joseph, at the end of the service, wherever Pastor Joseph of his, uh, where he, he had to step out or something. He's going to pray at the end. Uh, we, we need to pray for the President of the United States, President Trump and his wife. They're both doing well, but they have both contracted uh, this virus uh, as well, but we're trusting the Lord for them and many others. But uh, there's a lot of fear and anxiety that came with it. And what the uh, Bible, uh, what, what Jehoshaphat tells us there is that when, when the enemy comes and when, when judgment and sword and pestilence and, and disease come, he called the people not only to prayer and fasting, but he called them to come together in the house of the Lord and to stand together and to join together in prayer. And that's what our message last Sunday was about. And what we want to do today is we want to come together today and look at this prayer that Jehoshaphat prayed because this prayer has so much, uh, so many powerful points to help us to learn how to pray even as we live today not facing physical warfare but we face a spiritual battle. The battle that Jehoshaphat was praying was a, was a type of spiritual warfare that we deal with even in our lives today. If you'll go to the next slide for me, Dennis. Uh, oh, let me... Before I go to that point, this is something the Lord gave me from last week. Jehoshaphat was driven by fear, but that fear did not call, take him into a place and a path of worry and stress and strife. But his fear set him to seek the Lord. 
And I talked about that a little bit last Sunday. But fear, God never will allow any kind of fear to come in your life. His intention when that fear comes into your life is not to cause you to be terrified, not to cause that spirit of intimidation to come over you, but that fear that comes into your life is a fear that is set is meant to set you to a place that you run to God and you call on God and you ask God to help you and you ask God to intervene in this situation and Jehoshaphat found that to be true and the beginning of spiritual warfare happened not when he gave in to the fear but when the fear that he was feeling drove him to his knees and he began to say God we need you and we need your help In the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul talks about uh, battling in the spirit of the flesh and and he in this in this chapter he talks about the the um, the sins of the flesh and then he talks about the gifts of the spirit uh, and many of the works of the flesh are in, in verses 19 through 21 there's 17 different things that talk about the, their works of the flesh here. These three armies and these three nations that were coming against Israel, as I went through them and I looked at these three nations that were coming against them, they represent more than two-thirds of the works of the flesh that we even see in our spiritual lives. The three armies that were coming against Judah were the armies of the Moabites, the armies of the Ammonites, and the armies of a country called the Meunites, or the people of the Meunites. These three nations came from descendants of Abraham. Not his children, but descendants of descendants of Abraham. The Moabites and the Ammonites came out of an ancestral sexual relationship between Lot, Abraham's nephew, and his two daughters. The Meunite people came, they are from the... uh, the, the lineage or the heritage of Esau, which was the brother of Jacob, who became a rebellious, uh, just a, a one that, that uh, his, when his father, uh, oh my goodness, I just lost his name, Abraham Isaac, when his father Isaac uh, had, gave birth to these twins, Esau just became a rebel in the house. And, and he went, went, uh, left his homeland and took wives from pagan people, became a worshiper of idolatry, became a worshiper and followed after witchcraft and followed after lewdness and sorcery and things like that. And from those three people, we see the bondages of things like sexual perversion, like adultery that's there, fornication that's there, hatred, strife, heresies, drunkenness, witchcraft, sorcery, and so many more So these guys were in a spiritual battle as well as they were in a physical battle. So as we look at this today, and what I want to do today, as we we talked about the, the prayer last time and how it came today, I want to focus your attention to this prayer that Jehoshaphat prayed and how that prayer is a prayer that we can still pray today and we can still use it in the battles and the warfare that we fight against the enemy in the body of the prayer here today in, in 2 Chronicles 20, and we're getting ready to read it together, it's a very different prayer that Jehoshaphat prays. I haven't found any prayer like this in the Bible. There may be some others similar to this. I could not find them. And I'm going to be looking a little bit more uh, this week as I'm preparing for next week's sermon. But in this prayer that he prays, there are five questions that he asks in this prayer. Or five questions that he brings forth. Four of the questions are rhetorical questions. And a rhetorical question, I'll explain it to you more in a moment, but basically a rhetorical question is a question that you ask, but you don't really expect an answer for it. Uh, and, and I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. And he asked four rhetorical questions, and these questions are not asked to the people. These are questions that he asks to God in the body of his prayer. And then the fifth question he asks is a normal question like you and I ask questions, a question that he wants God to answer and he wants God to to intervene in. So let's go into our text. If you've got your Bible with you, it'll be on the screen, but I'd love for you to get it in your Bibles and I'd love for you to look at it. Thank you, Jeffrey, for following me. Um, Let's start right there at verse number five. It says, Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. 
and said, O Lord God, our Father, God of our fathers, first question, are you not a God? Are you not God in heaven? Second question, and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nation? Third question, and in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to stand against you? So right there in verse 6, we see that Jehoshaphat gives these three rhetorical questions to God. And he's kind of asking God, God, is this not true? Did you do this? Are you this? Is this how you operate? Is this how you work? Verse number 7, he asked another rhetorical question. Are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever? And then he leaves the questions and then he goes into a little bit of a historical laying the groundwork saying, God, this is what we need of you. And they, in verse number 8, he says, and they dwell in it. That's, he's talking about that land, and they dwell in your land, and they built you a sanctuary in your name, saying, if disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we talked about that last week, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and we will cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and you will save us. And that's, that's what we, we dealt with last week. This week, as I was reading some more stuff and studying some more things, one guy made this statement. He said that wherever God's presence is, His name will always be there. And wherever God's name is, His presence will always be there. And I like that. So if you're looking for God's presence, just go to a place where God's name is called upon, where God's name is lifted up. And when you lift up His name, God's presence will fill that place where you are. Amen. That's a good word for you right there. Look at verse number 10. Now he gets to the meat of the matter. Like God didn't know this, and we do this same thing, and this is what you're supposed to do in prayer. He says, and now, God, and now, here are the people of Ammon, the people of Moab, and the people of Mount Seir, or some translations say the Munites, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. What, what uh, uh, Jehoshaphat is telling them is back when God brought uh, the Israelites out of Egypt, they came to each one of the lands of these, these uh, relatives of theirs, and each time they could have gone in and just wiped them completely out. But instead of doing that, God said, no, don't touch them. These people are your relatives. They are from your fathers and your forefathers, so you leave them alone. And so, uh, uh, you know, Jehoshaphat's calling back to God, saying, oh, God, you remember, we could have dealt with these people, and you didn't let us now. And so, so just remember this, and look what he says in verse 11. He said, now here they are. They're rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given to us to inherit. Now, isn't that the same way the devil does to us today? That's what the devil wants to do. His whole, his whole plan and his whole purpose is to rob us and steal from us what God through Jesus Christ has given us. The Bible says Satan comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He wants to take away and rob and, and divide you and separate you from anything that God has said you're supposed to have. And the same thing he did back then... He does now today. And then verse number 12 is the, where the fifth question comes in. He said, oh God, will you not judge them? Oh God, will you not judge them? Now I asked my, I, I, I couldn't figure out yesterday if this was a rhetorical question or if this was a real like, God, I'm asking you a question because now I need some help. And I leaned toward that way. I even sent it to my daughters and my wife. And, and we all went back and forth. And we never came to a conclusion. So I'm looking at this as not rhetorical. But this is, God, I need an answer. So now what am I saying? A rhetorical question is a question. And if I can tell you this, I'll give you a little short English lesson. I probably spent two hours this week studying about a rhetorical question. I wasted, I really wasted that two hours, but I was trying to get in my mind how I can make this simple for you so you could understand, knowing that most of you are smarter than me, and I wasted all that time, but at least I have a little better grip on it. But let me give you this definition of what I found a rhetorical question is. is a question that's asked not to necessarily get an answer, but to either create drama or, and this is what I believe Jehoshaphat is doing, to make a declaration 
in the question. And that's what I believe Jehoshaphat is doing with these four points. He's making declarations. He's making declarations about the character of God. Uh, a, a very uh, Pastor Bethel did a beautiful job at the end of the first service. He came up and asked some great rhetorical questions, kind of as a joke, but also kind of just kind of emphasizing the need of it. But a rhetorical question is this. Do fish swim? Now that's a question. It's rhetorical because it's so silly you don't need to answer it. There is an answer for it, but when somebody asks that question, they're not really expecting an answer. Another one is the Pope Catholic. Now we know the Pope has to be Catholic, but it's a rhetorical question. You ask it not in the point of, of getting an answer, but you're making a declaration to people that, hey, the Pope is Catholic. But it's a literary way of using some point to make a point. And I believe that Jehoshaphat is making points. And why he uses these rhetorical questions is he's trying to get the focus of the, Judah, the people of Judah off of their fear, off of their worry, off of their problem, and get it on this great and mighty God. I had something written here. He is praying to God. But he is also building the faith of his people in the God of their fathers. The God of their father Abraham, the God of their father Isaac, and the God of their father Jacob. He's also making a declaration of God's character and God's person. His rhetorical questions are used, and listen to this, you want to write this down in your notes. His rhetorical questions are used as a tool to get the fear in the hearts of his people replaced with faith in their God. Every question he asks, and you're going to see this in just a moment, that he is seeking to remove the fear of an impending disaster and to get that fear replaced with faith in a God who is good and who is powerful and who is loving. Hallelujah. So let's look at these questions. Here are the four questions on the screen. The first one is in verse number 6, I believe. Verse number, yeah, verse number six. The first question says, O Lord, our, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? That's his first question. Second question, do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? Third question, is your hand, excuse me, in your hand, is there not power and might, and might, it's supposed to be might, not mighty, and might so that none is able to withstand you? Now, he, he's not asking these questions to the people. He's praying, and in his prayer, he's declaring them to God. This morning, when I was leading you in prayer, as I came up as the, after the worship team was, was worshiping, ooh, that scared me. I thought somebody was behind me there. As the worship team, I came up and I just began to make these declarations to God. Oh, God, you are mighty. God, you are wonderful. God, you are powerful. And I was just making declarations that were statements. He's doing the same thing. He's just doing it in the form of a question. And the fourth question, he said, are you not our God who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel, and you gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend forever. I love how this plays out, and I think by the time I get to the end here in about 15 to 20 minutes, you're going to, I hope I'll tie this together for you, and you're going to see what I saw in this when the Lord opened it up to me. As I was uh, yesterday finishing up my preparation and study for today's message, I uh, felt like the Holy Spirit just dropped in my heart. He said, I want you to go look at the Lord's Prayer. And I want you to do that with me right now. This is not on the screen, so if you have your Bible with you, turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. And as the Holy Spirit was telling me, He said, I want you to look at the similarities between the Lord's Prayer that Jesus prayed or, or the model prayer. Some people say that we call it the Lord's Prayer, and that's not really the best prayer. This should be called the Disciples' Prayer because this is the prayer where He's teaching us how to pray. But look at verse number 9, and we know this well, but let's read it anyway. He says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come and Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Some translations say forever and ever. 
Amen. And in that prayer Jesus prays, Jesus doesn't use any questions, but he makes definite declarative statements about God. And I want to show you as I begin to look at these four questions uh, that uh, uh, Jehoshaphat asked in his prayer, how those four questions lined up perfectly with Jesus' prayer in the New Testament and how it ties together that a part of our principle of praying and a part of the, the uh, practice of praying is not just to always come and ask God, ask God, ask God, but a major portion of our prayer should always be about coming to God and acknowledging who God is. Acknowledging God for His, his character and acknowledging God for His uh, attributes and acknowledging Him for the power that He has and the power that He wants to use in our lives and how He wants to help us to overcome the enemies of our lives. So with that said, let's jump right into this. And I'm going to give you five characteristics of Jehoshaphat's prayer. Another uh, title I gave it, I just put one on the screen. It could be five attributes of God in Jehoshaphat's prayer, ever how you want to write that down. And the first one is, in this prayer, he declared God's sovereignty. He declared God's sovereignty. In other words, he made a declaration at the beginning of his prayer, right there in verse number 6. He said, O Lord God of heaven, excuse me, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? Hallelujah. And what he was saying there is the same thing that Jesus prayed in verse number 9 when Jesus said, Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. And Jehoshaphat is making a declaration and Jesus uh, affirms that declaration that God is the God of all gods. That God doesn't rule from a throne that just sits in Jerusalem. God doesn't rule from a throne that sits in Nairobi. God doesn't rule from a throne that sits in whatever seat of power there will be on this earth. That God's seat of sovereignty, God's seat of royalty and kingship is in heaven and he is sovereign above and over all things. Hello. That's when you should have said amen. Come on, guys. Wake up. It's 1230, 1220s. So you should be awake good by now. God is God. He's the sovereign of all gods. He's the, he's the highest of all gods. He is the God of all gods, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. He is the sovereign God of all things. And to acknowledge that God is above all things gives us that complete declaration that when we say, God, you are God above all things, what we are also saying at the same time, excuse me, at the same time, everything else is under God and everything else is beneath God. Every problem, every worry, every situation, every business, every relationship, every idea we have, every thought we have, it's all under the sovereignty of God. Ultimately, as we live this Christian life, we have to surrender to God's rule, to God's sovereignty over us. Our lives cannot be, uh, cannot be ruled by the manipulated manipulations of this life. Our life cannot be ruled by our circumstances. Our life cannot be ruled by how we feel today or how we feel tomorrow. We need to put our life under the rulership and under the guidance of God the Sovereign who is above all things, who is beyond all things. He wants us to know that He is God. And when Jehoshaphat says this before his people, what he's telling his people and what he's declaring to the, to the people there of, uh, of Jer Jerusalem and Judah is that it makes no difference what's happening with these guys down there. They're 15, 18 miles away from us. They're coming toward us. It makes no difference in the long run as long as we remember that God is the God in heaven and that God is in control of all things. This came to me this week and I wrote it down. I believe in that saying that Joshua was declaring this. He was declaring that before this army comes, you are God. Even when this army gets here and we're going to be in the midst of this battle, you are God. 
And even tomorrow after this battle is over and whatever takes place and whatever happens. And at this point, Jehoshaphat didn't know if they were going to be there, if they were going to be slaves. He didn't know as the king if he was going to be dead or alive. He knew that God is still God. And brothers and sisters, if we know that God is sovereign, if we know that God is God, then we have to let God be God whatever the circumstance takes place. Whatever happens. When COVID comes, when Corona comes... He's still God. When our, the place we work shuts down or they lay us off, He's still God. If our business is lost and we don't, have a, we don't have that business anymore and we've lost everything, He's still God. Hallelujah. If we get a report from the doctor and the doctor says we're positive, He's still God. Okay? He's God. He's God. He's God. He's sovereign over all things. The sovereignty of God, that is God, all understanding must come to the place that if He's God then that means we're not God. And if He's God, we have to give the control, we have to give the results, we have to give everything to God. Hallelujah. Second thing, I didn't mean to spend so long on the first one because I've got four more to go. The second thing He says in His prayer, He declares that God is faithful. Or He declares God's faithfulness to us. In verse number 6, that second thing He said, He said, not only do you rule and uh, you rule from heaven, but He also says, do you not rule over the kingdoms of these nations? Hallelujah. Not do you just sit up in heaven. So what He's saying here, you are God of the heavens, but you're not just the God who is far away from us. But you're also the God who rules over every nation, every kingdom, every tribe, every people group. You are the God over every one of these things. And you are faithful in your declaration to what you do. Jesus prayed something very similar to that in, in, uh, in chapter, verses 10 and 11 and 12 of His prayer. He said, God, your kingdom come and your will be done. Where? On earth just like it is in heaven. You see, He is sovereign there, but He's also sovereign here as well. He controls what goes on in the heavenly realms, but He also controls what goes on here on the earthly realms. You know where else He controls? He controls even what goes on in the, in the inner parts of the earth, which will ultimately one day be the place of destruction. He is the God of all things. And because He is God there and here, He is a God who is faithful, and He will fulfill His word and His will and His his purpose on the earth. Jesus prayed in that prayer talking about the faithfulness of God. He said, let your kingdom come on earth just like it's in heaven. And today, God, make sure that our daily bread is taken care of. Forgive us of all of our sins and even forgive those people who have sinned against us from the outside. Praise the Lord. He is our sovereign God. He shows His sovereignty on the earth by being faithful to His word. Oh, that was good. You should have heard. Did you hear that? He shows His sovereignty on, the word, on this earth by being faithful to the Word He's given us. He's given us this Word and He spoke His Word. He's delivered this Word. He's given it to us in a written form. He also speaks it to us uh, by His prophets. He speaks it to us by His pastors. He speaks it to us by His teachers, even by His Spirit. He will declare His Word to you. And His Word shows the faithfulness that He have. Uh, the Apostle Paul said several things about the faithfulness of God. He said that God is so faithful and His Word is so faithful that God, it is God who will work both His will and His good pleasure in our life. God doesn't desire for our lives to be just lives that, are, that, are, that have no direction, that have no hope, that have no future. But it is His desire, it is God who wants to work both His will and His pleasure in us. That's very similar to that scripture we used last week in Jeremiah where God says, I know the plans I have for you. Plans that are to give you a hope and a promise and a future. God wants to do His pleasure and His work in our lives and He will fulfill His word if we will trust Him and we will declare His faithfulness over our lives. Uh, again, the Apostle Paul says, He is faithful and He will strengthen you and He will protect you. In all things. Again, Paul says in Timothy, says, even when we have no faith, when we are faithless and we've even left the faith, God still remains faithful. God cannot disown himself. 
So brothers and sisters, I want to tell you today in this declaration that Jehoshaphat was making to his people, he says, are you not God in heaven? Are you not God even on this earth? He was telling his people, he said, you know what? This army is coming against us. This battle's coming, but God is faithful. And whatever you're going through and whatever you're dealing with, brothers and sisters, I want you to know that your God that you serve, if you serve Him, if you love Him, if you'll trust Him, if you'll follow Him, if you'll obey Him, your God is faithful and your God will see you through. He'll help you through. He'll walk you through these things. We don't understand all the things that come into our life. We don't understand all the situations we face. I see my brother Kevin back there. And just a few months ago, uh, just out of nowhere, we lost Kevin's mom. Kevin's mom just... Just one day she was there and the next day she was with the Lord. And it's one of those things that's hard to understand and it's hard to explain. And you look to God and say, God, why? You know, Kevin's there and his brother and his two little sisters. And God, we don't understand those things, but we have to trust that God's been faithful. And I think if you talk to him today and you talk to his sisters and his brothers, even though they miss their mom, they've seen the faithfulness of God. They've seen God walking with us, with them. And all of us have seen that. We go through tough times. We face hard times. Some of us live in times of, of real trial, in times of tribulation sometimes. But all Always, if we will put our trust and hope in God, we'll see the faithfulness of God. And Jehoshaphat was trying to get his people to see that God is faithful. The third thing that he declared and the third question that he asked, he made a declaration. He declared the power of God. I wrote this down because it sounded better. And I didn't know the songs that our worship team was singing today. But he declared the omnipotency of God. He declared the omnipotent power of God over all of his enemies. He said, in your hand, O God, is there not power and might? And he didn't stop there. And he said there in verse number, number six, he said, and no one. Everybody say, no one. No one is able to withstand you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's no power like God's power. There's no power like God's power. Did we sing a song like that, Jeffrey? Isn't there a song, something about ain't no power like the Holy Ghost power? Maybe I got a whole other song that's going on there because God's power can't be beat or something. I don't know. It may be another song and I'm just making up that. But God's power is greater than any power. I don't know if y'all played this game when you were little kids uh, in, here, here in the different parts of Africa that many of you are from, but uh, we used to play this game in America uh, when we were kids, and maybe it's, we'd get on a playground or out somewhere, and maybe two boys would get in a little, a little fight or a little scuffle or something, and instead of fighting one another, they'd start talking about their daddies. And one guy say, well, my daddy's bigger than your daddy. And the other guy say, well, yeah, but my daddy's stronger than your daddy. And then one guy would say, well, my daddy's got more money than your daddy. And they just go back and forth, back and forth, trying to see who's daddy. And what we can say when it comes to the kingdom of God is our daddy is like nobody's daddy. Our daddy's got more power. Our daddy's got more strength. Our daddy's got more might. He's got more wealth. He's got more of all the power that there is. And there's nobody can stand up to our daddy. Hallelujah. Because our daddy is powerful. Hallelujah. In Jesus' prayer, he said the same. He prayed that same prayer, but he took it to another level. In Jesus' prayer in verse number 13, he said, Oh Lord God, do not lead us into temptation, but also deliver us from the power of the evil one. Hallelujah. God not only has, gives us power over the faces and the forces that we, the, the, excuse me, the, the problems and the situations we face on this earth, but He also gives us power over all of the demonic forces, over all the evil forces, over all the temptations and all the struggles and all the trials that the devil will throw at us. We have power over those things because God has that power. And Jehoshaphat was standing before his people and he declared to them that God, the God you serve, in his hand there is power and in his hand there is might. And the armies of the Moabites and the armies of the Ammonites and the armies of the Munites, they have no power against our God's power. Now they have power against us. They can defeat us, but they cannot defeat God in us. 
Hallelujah, hallelujah. I love that scripture in Isaiah 59, verse 1, where it says, The arm of the Lord is not short, and His ear has not become dull. That doesn't mean that God's got a short arm. That just means His arm has not become weak, and His arm has not become any less powerful than it ever had, has been before. The, 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 the strong right hand, the righteous right hand of God is powerful to save, powerful to deliver, powerful to heal. Hallelujah. Job 20, Job in chapter 26 if you read that whole chapter he talks about the power of God and the mercy of God and how God just established everything by his great power at one point he said that God's power and God's wisdom and God's miraculous things they're past us even understanding or past us even knowing but in verse 14 he says this this is just the beginning of what God does No one can comprehend the thunder of God's power. Wow, I like that. Nobody can comprehend. Oh, God God can do more with a, a hand clap than the world can do with all the mighty weapons they have. I don't know. I hope you were watching me a few weeks ago when I talked about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I talked about the second coming and I talked about him riding on that white horse. And the Bible says that all he's going to do is he's going to speak a word out of his mouth. And, this, and, and it's written there that a sword is going to come out of his mouth. And we don't really think that actually a giant sword is going to come out. That's, a, that's a, a picture, an idea that whatever he speaks is going to be such a mighty, powerful weapon that it's going to bring confusion to all those armies of the world. And the greatest armies with all the greatest weapons, maybe nuclear, all types of, 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 of powerful jets and powerful rocket launchers, they're all just going to just melt at the voice of God and the power of God. He is all powerful, brothers and sisters. And He has power not just for the end of time, but He's got power to help you today. Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, God has eternal power and a divine nature so that no one can have an excuse for not knowing who God is. In other words, God has so much power that, and he, he displays it every day, what Paul is saying, when the sun comes up in the morning, it doesn't just happen. That's the power of God. When the moon comes up at night, that's the power of God. When, when, the, uh, when, God, when rains come and then God sends out the sunshine, that's the power of God. Everything you see happen is God's mighty power. And then one last scripture before I go in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I hope you're writing these down. Verses 9 and 10, he says this. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. And the Apostle Paul said, I will boast in my weakness so Christ's power may rest on me. He is a powerful God and he, has, he, he, he doesn't just have power to have power, but he has power to use on our behalf. He has power to use when we need that power. He will bring his power to our benefit and to our rescue. The fourth question that Jehoshaphat asked or he said made a declaration that God was good and that God will keep his promises. Listen to what he says here in verse number 7. And I'll just, I don't have it on the screen. I'll just go over and read it in my Bible. He said, are you not God? Are you not our God? And I like the way he kept saying our God, our God, our God throughout this. Who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and gave it to the descendants of Abraham who is your friend forever. And what he's saying there is that this God made promises all the way to Abraham way back in the beginning in Genesis chapter 12. He made these promises to Abraham. Then when Abraham died and his son Isaac came along he made them to Isaac. Then when Isaac died and his son Jacob came along he made them to Jacob. Then when Jacob came along and he died he made them to the twelve sons that went on to the twelve tribes. And that promise and that word of God just kept being fulfilled and kept being fulfilled and even through all the times that they disobeyed God, all the times they turned their backs on God, all the times that they 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 went away and they they just they shook their fists at God and said we don't need you and they worshiped idols and they bowed down to stone and they bowed down to idols made of gold. God remained good and God remained faithful to his promise over them and God continues to do that and Jesus even said that same thing in his prayer in verse 13 Jesus said yours O God is the kingdom 
And yours is the power. And yours is the glory forever and ever and ever. And when Jesus was saying that, Jesus was saying, God, all the things that apply to your kingdom, all the things that apply to your children, all the things that apply to, to the children and the promises of, 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 that you have given to your, your descendants from the beginning of time, they're not only good for now, but they're good forever and forever and forever and forever. And Jehoshaphat was reminding the people of God's promises and God's goodness. But he is also assuring them that the God not only is able to get them out of this situation, but that God is able to take care of anything that they need. And brothers and sisters, I just declare to you today, as I'm coming close to the end, and we've got one more point that I'll finish this up with. I declare to you today, just as the Jehoshaphat, when he prayed this prayer over his people, I, I declare over you today that God is good. I declare over you today that his mercy does endure from everlasting to everlasting to everlasting. I declare over you today the words of the Apostle Paul, Peter when he says that God is not slack or he is not slow concerning his promises. But if he made a promise, he will keep his promise as he said he would do. And I declare over you today, 2 Corinthians 1.20, that the promises of God in Jesus Christ are yes and amen. And if God made a promise, God is good and God is faithful, and God will keep the promise He made to you. When we make that declaration to somebody, we say, we'll say God is good, and they say, uh, what is it you say, God is good, and what do people say back? All the time. How could I not think of that? God is good, and we say all the time, but sometimes we just say that but don't really mean it. Because we'll say God is good all the time. Then we'll go over here and start complaining to everybody about everything in our life. And how everybody treats us wrong. And how we don't ever get any blessings. And God never helps us. And we've always just got one problem after another. And pastor doesn't like me. He didn't shake my hand. And this and that. And my boss. And, and we say God is good. But then we let our mouth just continually kill the goodness of God that he has. God is good. That doesn't mean that life doesn't have problems. And life doesn't have issues. Because God is good when I go through the issues issues and I go through the difficulties and I go through the problems of life I have somebody that I can cling to and I can hold on to and I can say God I know that all this is falling apart but I know that you're good it says the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous everybody has issues everybody in this life has problems some people don't have a God that they can call on he's there but they've never acknowledged the fact that he's God and and what I want you to notice here before I go to this last thing. He's telling them this about God in the face of their enemy. Tomorrow, the real possibility is going to take place that they're all going to die. That their men are going to be killed in battle. Their women are going to be taken, raped, and taken off as slaves. And all of their possessions are going to be gone. And he's looking at them in the face in the midst of what's getting ready to happen. He's telling them, telling them. I want you to know the God who was faithful to Abraham, who made this promise, he's still faithful to you today. That's when it gets hard. That's when it gets tough. It's easy to say God is good when there's money in the bank, when our kids are doing well, when we, everything is just great. We got a nice house. We maybe even have a car. Maybe we, we have benefits and it's easy to say God's good, but boy, when things start turning sideways, when things start getting hard, when we lose our job, when we're kicked out of our apartment, when we don't have any food in the cupboard to feed our kids, when school's opening up in a few weeks and we don't have money to pay the fees, is he still good? That's when we have to truly depend that God is good, that God is faithful, that the God who made the promises before, He will continue to make those promises again. And then the last thing, and I'll close with this. He declared His complete dependency on God. Now in verse number 12, as I told you earlier, He asked the first question, of the questions he asked that was not rhetorical, he asked this question, and he was really hoping that God was going to answer. Now, you got to come back next week to find out what God said. Well, you can read ahead and see, but I'm not going to talk about it till next week. 
But listen to what, there's something real special here. After he said this, he said, God, he worded it like this. He said, will you not judge them? In other words, what he was really saying there, he said, God, are you not going to intervene here? God, are, are you going to help us? And if I can, if I can say this in, my, in our modern vernacular, what he was saying was, he was saying, help! God, are you going to help me? God, are you there? God, God, are you there? God, I need you. God, are you going to come and take care of this situation? But look what he did when he said that. He asked that question, but as soon as he asked that question, he made this statement. He said, we have no power against this multitude that's coming against us. And we don't know what to do. Now this is a king. He's the king of Judah. He sits on the throne in the city of Jerusalem. Guys like David sat on that throne and guys like Solomon and, and some other guys came after him uh, uh, that, that sat there. I, my mind's blank right now. I can't even think of one of them. Rehoboam sat there. Rehoboam is the one that caused all the problems and got the, the nations divided. Great men have sat on this throne and he's declaring. And now notice, he doesn't leave the congregation of the people and go over to his prayer room. He's still right there in front of the people. This king stands in front of his people and he said, God, I don't know what to do. I don't have the power to stand against this great multitude. Now that may not mean a whole lot to you today, just reading it and looking at it, but to me, I see that as an acknowledgement of a man who's willing to surrender his status as the king. Because everybody looks at a king, they think the king has all the answers. I get that sometimes people look at the pastor and they say, well, you're the pastor, you're supposed to hear from God, you're supposed to know everything. You know, and that puts a lot of pressure on a pastor. I, I try to hear from God, and I want to hear from God. But you know what? Sometimes I don't know what to do. And for some reason, God's being real quiet, and He hadn't told me what to do. We get to points and places in our life, and maybe, I don't know for you, Pastor Joseph, you may have figured this out already at your young age. Maybe the best, I'm the best as a leader when I don't know what to do. I'm the best as a husband when I don't know what to do. Maybe I'm the best as a father when I don't know what to do. Because when I don't know what to do and when I come to the end of myself, that's when I really will dig into God and say, God, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And Jehoshaphat got there. And maybe some of you are sitting here this morning and you're saying, Pastor Ron, I don't know what, I don't know what to do. I've got this happening in my life and this is happening in my life and this is happening and all these things have come against me and I don't know what to do. But look at the last statement he makes. The last statement he makes there. He says, God, I don't know what to do. But you know what? My eyes are on you. And if I can just declare anything to you today, don't depend on what you know. Depend on what God is willing and able to do through you. One of my friends posted on Facebook yesterday. He said, uh, just he was making a, wasn't rhetorical question, but he could have twisted it to that. He said, it seems like I always hear better from God when I get quiet and will listen. Which is true. And then I added to his thing because I was working on this message. I also hear better from God when everything I've tried has failed. And I don't know what else to do. Maybe you need to just get to a point that you just lift up your heart and lift up your voice and lift up your hands and say, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to overcome this sin that just keeps coming into my life and I keep, I keep falling to it and I keep giving into it. I don't know what to do with this situation at work that I've gotten myself into and I've, I've told this lie and I've told this lie and I've told another lie to cover up that lie. I don't know what to do, God. I don't know what to do about that money that went missing and I know it went missing and I know how it went missing but I, can't, I don't have the money to get it back where it's supposed to be and I don't know what to do, God. What am I supposed to do? And 
It's not just problems like that. It might just be issues. I don't know what to do in my relationship with my children. I don't know what to do with my relationship with my husband or my wife. God, I need help to be a better husband. I need help to be a better wife. I need help to be a better Christian. God, what am I supposed to do? How can I make this work? How can I make this better, God? And as we make those declarations, as we humble ourselves, as we take ourselves out of the picture, out of the seat of control, and we turn it over to God, like Jehoshaphat did, we just say, God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes, I'm going to look to you. Somewhere in the Bible, I didn't look this up, it just came into my head. I think it's one of the psalmists that says, I'll look to you, Lord. I'll look to you. We sing a song like that. I cry out to you, Lord. I seek you, Lord. I wait for you, oh God, to help me. The king needed God's help. Maybe this morning where you're at, I want you to know God is sovereign. God is faithful. God is powerful. And God is good. And he's ready. He's willing to help you. He's ready, willing to direct you. I had a lady sitting over here this morning. As soon as she came out, she said, Pastor Ron, I've been trying to make a decision for months and months, and I've been going back and forth, back and forth, and just go, well, I'm supposed to do this, or am I supposed to do this? And when you said that, just said that we'd have put our eyes on the Lord and just quit trying to figure it all out. She said, when I was sitting there, it's like the Lord just came in and spoke to me, just sitting right there, what I was supposed to do. That's what God wants to do in your life. He does this for Jehoshaphat. Next week we'll talk about that. How God intervenes in a situation that just seems so completely impossible. And God changed it and Jehoshaphat didn't have to do a thing. But trust God. Where are you at in your life? Let me pray for you. Father, I ask you right now just to be with your people today. Put a Hopefully a, an encouraging word, but it also can be a very strong word as well, God, because the word that I've shared today brings a lot back on us, and it puts a lot of responsibility back in our lives to learn to pray prayers of spiritual warfare, not just, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, but learn to pray prayers of spiritual warfare that first and foremost acknowledge who you are in our lives. God, and I pray that as we have acknowledged today through the declarations of Jehoshaphat that number one, you are a sovereign God. Number two, you are a faithful God and you keep your promises. Number three, you are powerful and there's no power that can stand against you. And number four, we've declared, God, that you are good. And your promises are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. And if we stand on the promises of your word, we will in time see the, the hand of God and the victory of the Lord in every situation of our lives. So, Father, I don't know what sisters are going through today. I don't know what they're dealing with today. But I know this, that as they lift up their hands and if they cry out to you and they cry out in distress and and help God that you will lay your hand in their life you will speak to them we've got to wait till next week to see how you spoke to Jehoshaphat but right now just as what happened to that lady in the first service you can speak to people right here where they are you can open doors maybe some people here today that really need a job and they they've been crying out for a job and praying for a job father i believe this week you can open up a door for them to go into that right door and walk through that door and that job will be there waiting for them father and i pray that that would happen in jesus name uh, and and if it's not the job is not there already maybe it's something you're still preparing and it will be there and they just have to continue to be faithful now, maybe there's somebody here today gotten a report from a doctor that's not a good report. Father, and we just trust that report to the doctor. We lay it out right before the Lord today. We lay it at your feet today, God, and we say, help me, God. Help me, God. Help me, God, with this report I've got because it, it goes against your word. It goes against what your word has promised me. It goes against your character. It goes against your power. God, help me with this, with this word. Give me strength to be able to live 
in your purpose with what this is saying in my life, God. Father, I pray that you administer to your brothers and sisters, to your children today. Let them feel the delivering hand of God on their life. And as they declare in spiritual warfare throughout this week, if they make declarations of faith and declarations of trust and declarations of hope, Father, may they hear the word of the Lord the same way Jehoshaphat heard the word of the Lord. And may you send a prophet into their life. May you send a priest into their life. May you send a word. May you send an a, a, a open door. May you send an answer to a question. And we pray that in Jesus' name. And I just pray over everyone that as they go out today, your blessing would be on their life. And that they would sense and know the presence and the power of God in their lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I hope that that word's been a blessing to you. It went a little longer, I think, this time than it did the first service. I'm sorry for that, but I hope it was a good word. And, hey, you had not been in church in a long time, so it's okay to stay a few extra minutes today. But we're going to try to keep these services to about an hour and a half. And we're really... We've only been an hour and 35 minutes, so we've actually done pretty good anyway. So praise the Lord. I, I was thinking we'd been two hours already, but we haven't. God bless you. Keep inviting people to church. Tell them, hey, church is good. After every service, we're spraying it down with this, uh, with a, in, not a, not a, I started to say